mentioned in other contexts of looking at mummified and even non-mummified skeletal tissue where you can extract the proteins and you can look at how these proteins have changed uh, as a result of past disease. And this is very much now cutting edge. We're still at the stage where well, my colleagues, this is not my area, uh, are looking at this and its application. But this is a very exciting uh, area. The challenges, as I kind of listed there, is the, the, you know, the, the problem, as you're all aware, of mummification. It's obviously changing in the same way. It's changing you know, the DNA, the, D, the, the, the genome, and some of the damage that occurs. There's the same problem, of course, of damage to the proteins. Uh, and therefore, if you're looking at the proteins and how they've changed, but nevertheless, there is a very good uh, evidence that although there are changes, you can still begin to tease out effects from a point of view of disease. But you do have these challenges, the preservation to, uh, and the technical challenges, which I certainly won't go into detail, of extracting, identifying uh, the molecules. And the thing is, this technique it's very much, and I know I don't want to go too over the top, but I think Manchester's a wonderful place uh, as a city, not only the university, but we are very much really world leaders in this field in relation to disease. And that's, of course, where the funding and hence the facilities and the building has come from, of course, not Egyptology, unfortunately. It's understandably the National Health Service and other funding bodies to look at the use of these approaches in modern diseases, but of course, we are interested in using these uh, and one of our colleagues, in fact, the other co-director of the KNH Centre, who is a world expert in this. So that's one area, the use of proteomics to understand uh, disease, which will complement the other techniques Prof Professor David has mentioned. Oh, here we have a, a long <laughs> phrase, Fournier transfer infrared spectroscopy. Now, the key take-home message for this particular technique and how it's used, the sample subject to infrared radiation, uh, the molecules absorb the radiation. The important thing is that you then get an emission spectra, and that relates to the composition. You're shining the, the uh, infrared onto the, the sample, mummy tissue or whatever. Uh, you're getting, uh, detecting a spectra, uh, and you can identify organic and inorganic uh, material within within your sample. So this is really called, called a molecular fingerprinting. This, for example, is in using forensic medicine. It's been developed in, uh, and also forensic in terms of m recently murdered people. Uh, and the important thing is you can screen samples for GCMS, which I'll come to in the uh, shortly, but the good thing about this technique is, of course, one of the problems with the techniques we've talked about uh, is, of course, they're destructive in the sense that you're, you know, ir irreplaceable material, you're having to take the material, you know, uh, prepare it for, let's say, histology or whatever, so it's destructive in that sense. The advantage of this technique is you just shine a light on it. But here we have one of my colleagues. Uh, this is a sample in the machine, and it will detect these compounds which will tell you, as we'll see in a moment, things about uh, the material used in mummification or even changes in the, the structure of the body and the like. Uh, so you can put samples in, and, and they're not damaged at all by the method. So that's a really useful kind of technique. Uh, and also, which I'll now come to in terms of this other technique of gas chromatography, is the previous technique isn't as good as this particular method for really fingerprinting, for example, if you're really interested in the composition of the resins or mummification, or let's say you have a, a sample from a tomb of a, you know, what's in the pot, literally, you know, was, or, you know, was it, let's say, protein, was it preserved? Uh, tissue or was it beer or something but again this method is destructive I even know it's a negative term but you're taking a sample tiny sample a few milligrams but nevertheless uh, it is then lost so the previous method will allow you to screen for using this technique which some of you may have heard of and Professor David touched upon GCMS and it's basically allows you to uh, the organic composition so the good thing is, and it was developed, for example, things like identifying the, the organic material in, in, in oils and things like this, including crude oil, the thing we, we use in our cars when it's refined. Uh, 
And the good thing from our point of view, and I'm sure many of you know this, that resins, for example, bitumen used in mummification is basically hydrocar, it's oil. Uh, so you can use the same technique to find out the composition, for example, of the resins. Uh, and you just compare it with the spectra. So don't worry about all of these peaks, but basically you've got these peaks which tell you how many carbon atoms are in your sample. By you know, modern technology and databases, you can basically say that this is one particular uh, organic material like hopane or stearane, and basically this tells you this sample contains bitumen. So this mummification process included bitumen. Uh, also, for example, other biomarkers, so you can tell for example, did your resin contain pine, frankincense, myrrh? So identifying you know, the material within, let's say, uh, you know, the, the, re the mummification resin. And you can use this other method even to take this further. So very useful and very, uh, again, powerful uh, technique. Now, in, in terms of case study and mentioning and uh, touching on uh, what Professor David mentioned, particularly in terms of this mummy Takabuti, the 25th dynasty uh, mummy from currently in the uh, Belfast Museum. Uh, we, we've used this and we'll be using this in the future GCMS uh, to look at the, uh, the resins, uh, so the present in relation to mummification. Small sample, you're only talking about 0.5, uh, sorry, 50 milligrams, so that's 0.05 a gram. It's a tiny amount. So although you are using material which you can't, it is a tiny you know, uh, amount that one is using. And as Professor David mentioned, it's been used to identify in the hair gel of this ancient Egyptian mummy, uh, including the fact that she had a perm or, you know, the, the mummy was literally, the, the hair was set. Uh, and one found all the kind of, you know, the equivalent of, I don't have my hair perm, but what's ever in uh, modern hair perm and when you're fitting your hair, the, the creams and things, and there was ancient, ancient Egyptian equivalents. And this method will allow you to identify that. Now, what we want to currently do uh, is to look now at rela in relation to mummification, uh, and in particular, uh, whether the, well, well firstly, the, the, the resin, what, what the mummification included in terms, but particularly the issue of bitumen. Was bitumen used in mummification? Uh, in terms of this diagram, all this just shows is that uh, that bitumen you know, was not used early on, but then by the, by the New Kingdom, more mummies, but then uh, later on, increasing use. But our mummy is in very much a bit of an interregnum between was it or wasn't it used on that particular mummy. So we're able to, to look at that. This is just shows the bit of kit that one uses. Uh, so we'll be taking the work forward to further understand the mummification process. and I'll, so there we're talking about techniques to look at organic material, the oils and the types of things, for example, in mummification or in your pots in the tomb in terms of what was deposited in the tomb in the pots. Another very useful method uh, is, tra is trace metals, and I won't even, well, I'll say it, inductively coupled plasma uh, spectroscopy, uh, absorption or mass spectroscopy. But this is basically a very sensitive method for analyzing for metals. So, of course, if you were, let's say, looking at a bronze or, or let's say, Tutankhamun's uh, 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 iron knife, then you don't really need to use this method. You've got simpler methods, which, because the concentrations of the metals, obviously, even the trace metals, uh, are very high, of course, in a metal. So even trace amounts of copper, let's say, in the iron is going to be high. But if you're looking at... Uh, for example, metals in pigments, for example, and you may say, well, why on earth one would want to look at metals in pigments? Uh, you know, but the reason is that one of the things we're interested in this bitumen that was used in this mummification of Takabuti was where the bitumen was from. And the thing is, it's an oil, so you can't just use uh, GCMS to say you've got all these different organic compounds because there's such a mix of them you can't really say well that's come from that site not that site but what you can is the metals because there are certain metals vanadium nickel and molybdenum where the, the amounts of metals vary between 
different oils. And for example, this is used in the modern oil industry, and in fact it's used in pollution studies. If some ship has spilled oil, you can look at the metals and you can say, you know, and the ship's gone away and it's a legal discharge. You can say, oh, well, that's a hydrocarbon from, let's say, the Arabian Gulf, and there was a ship passing from there, and therefore it was that ship that was a fault. So you can use this approach in relation to identifying the source of the bitumen that was used to mummify Takabuti. Was it from the, the, uh, uh, the Dead Sea area, or was it further east, or whatever? Because you've got different ratios of these metals. So in fact, we're applying this, as I say, to uh, this uh, uh, mummy, the 25th Dynasty mummy. So one can see these approaches, and of course, many of these, all the ones I've mentioned so far, proteomics probably not so, but the others, of course, are present, obviously, in Egypt as well. So, of course, it's not like suggesting that they, well, they couldn't, of course, be done in Egypt. That's, as you're all aware, they can, of course. Uh, then I'll be quick with this, I don't want to because of time. Uh, we're using a particular method that we're trying to develop, which is very efficient at getting out the metals. Because you're talking about concentrations of metals, and hence why we use this sophisticated, you know, of like one of, of several parts per billion. So you can't even imagine really a billion, you know, uh, in terms of a little tiny amount of metal in your, your sample. And when you're talking about a few milligrams of your original sample, you're talking just almost of a few atoms. So you've got to use these kind of techniques. So we're developing more sophisticated approaches to make sure that one can detect the metals, machineries. And obviously things like quality control is important because you know, there's more of these metals now on my finger from the desk and who is interested in, in, in and in certainly in terms of perhaps some collaboration with colleagues in Egypt. Uh, and this is what's called X-ray fluorescence. Now this thing, the diagram looks like a gun and in fact it does look like a gun. In fact getting it through customs one would have to be very careful because it literally is, you can see the handle uh, and it's about this size. Uh, and again, you can see the principle, any of you that are science background and you want to kind of, you know, look at the principle there. But the key thing is you fire a, an X-ray source at your sample and it gives you a spectrum of the various elements present. So you can see how much chromium, how much manganese, you know, uh, is in your sample. The thing is, with this method, is you literally point it at your sample. It's non-destructive, but also, of course, you haven't got to take your sample, let's say, out of Egypt. Uh, you can obviously look in situ, and you can look, actually, you can, don't even need to move it from where it was positioned at the time. You don't even need to take it to a laboratory to use, to, to do, uh, uh, to use this approach. And it's in, in, in you know, in non-destructive, as said, you can get bench top machines, but there are these handheld ones. This, these are used in everything from prospecting for metals uh, through to checking whether a painting is basically a fake. Because, you know, if, the, if you point it at a painting and it comes up with a particular metal, let's say, that was not used by Rembrandt and it's supposed to be a, by Rembrandt, then it isn't by Rembrandt. Uh, and it's been already used but we are interested in, you know, for example, the examination of paint pigments, paint in the sense, obviously, of temple reliefs, for example. Any differences? It might be even possible in the future to identify groups of artists, to use a modern term. But then the other thing that interests me, because one of the areas I'm working on relates to, the, to Akhenaten uh, and the city of Tel al uh, we're interested in the possibility of identifying the source of the stone that was used in the temples. Because as some of you may know, that there are, uh, you know, it's obvious that the temples, uh, Akhenaten's temples at Tel Alamana, were, well, in fact, we don't even know where they were quarried. But there were stones that were, as you know, when the temples were demolished, were scattered all over. You know, and they've been found, for example, at Abydos. So did Akhenaten build a temple at Abydos? I suspect not. He didn't. He wasn't keen on Osiris, as many of you will know. Uh, so it may have been these were moved and then used in other constructions. And this is in pharaonic times. I don't mean modern. Uh, and therefore, this method may allow us to actually be able to 
show where the stone you know, uh, was from. So let's say it was just moved from Amarna, or no, it was quarried locally, and therefore there may have been a temple constructed there as opposed to these being moved. And then another method, scanning electron microscopy. Some of you will have uh, uh, know of this, and you will have seen pictures, let's say, of little zip, uh, plankton, lovely pictures of lovely shapes and the like. Uh, and you can use this method, again, for any, any scientist who are interested in this principle. Uh, so you can both look at the surface of the material under very high magnification using electron microscopy, which again, many of you will know, and I'm sure you've all seen pictures, including on the television. That it's often used, for example, when you're being shown the little plankton in the sea because they got very, some of them have got very attractive shapes. Uh, so one can use this in our approach. And also, again, you can find out what is in your sample. So you can put it under the electron microscope, see what it looks like, and you can see what the composition is. So again, uh, really advantageous. So, and this is the machine we use, the two machines we use in Manchester. Uh, and again, I time plus, of course, I was expecting a bigger screen. But this basically shows an electron micrograph of a sample. Uh, this, in fact, is, I'm cheating a bit here, this is actually from soil, not from the inside of a mummy, but I'll show you one of inside of a mummy in a moment. So it basically, you can see what, what the material looks like, but then you can also tell what it contains. So, for example, anybody remembers there, there I won't ask you, but in terms of your, your A-level or O-level equivalent chemistry or whatever, we have lead, PB. So basically, that lump of material, which is just a few, a fraction of millimetres in size, is a piece of lead. So you're able not only to see what the surface looks like, but the composition. And we're, gonna, we're, gonna, uh, we're using this within hopefully a few weeks to look at, again, Takabuti, uh, this, and I think you can just about see, well, see from the CT scan, these are the ribs, actually. This is the, the limbs, uh, and this is obviously CT scan through. This is packing material. The, the organs were removed, so they're not organs, but we're interested to know what this packing material is. Uh, so we can take a sample by endoscopy, a very tiny sample, uh, put it under the electron microscope, uh, look at it, see what it is, and identify what's in it. And we're not, I'm not suggesting it be lumps of metal, uh, unless you find goldy bits, but it'd be more, for example, is it something like silica? You know, it'll tell you about the, you know, what the material is. Is it sand? Is it lime? Is there bits of plants in it and things? So again, you can use this type of approach. Again, because of time, I won't go into detail, but the only, again, you always see this 50 milligrams, which is really good, that 50, 100, a tiny amount for nearly all these methods. So, so although they are you know, using this, perhaps I should think of a better term, destructive, it's a tiny, tiny sample that you're, you're, you're using to carry out this kind of analysis. Right, almost towards the end now, I realize time uh, is, Stable isotope, so yet an another method and approach that, that we're using. Uh, and this is not radioactive, as you all will have heard of carbon-14 and the use of carbon-14, for example, for aging samples, where you're getting a decay of a radioisotope. These are the natural, so stable, oh, I'll show them once. Uh, so you, and you have machines that will distinguish between the different forms, for example, carbon-13, carbon-14. Uh, nitrogen. Uh, now you may think, why? Why does this? Why is this important? It's all carbon uh, or nitrogen. But the good thing is, and I think I'm sure now you're beginning to see the logic in terms of our interest, is the ratio of these two types for carbon, nitrogen, oxygen varies, and it varies for for reasons I would really not go into, uh, obviously with time. Uh, between different material, fruit and vegetables, fish compared to terrestrial animals, the ratios of these vary. Uh, likewise with nitrogen, oxygen, wa uh, water source, for example. The good thing I think you can immediately see if you can analyze these, for example, and this is something we want to do with Takabuti, we can see uh, what she's at. And not by analyzing what's in the gut, but these 
uh, this car form of carbon will be absorbed into the body. So the ratio of these will be able to tell us, uh, you know, what, you know, literally what she ate. Because the evidence, interestingly enough, is that she seemed to have, you know, a diet of, for example, things like fish and fruit. Not so much your classic meat with the, you know, although she was, as Professor David mentioned, the, uh, the wife of the priest of a moon. Uh, but she may, you know, was she, was she actually an invalid, you know, and therefore this is almost an invalid diet. But we want to look at this in detail. It's again time pressing, so I won't. But you know, the sample we've looked at is probably recent. It's a bit of a hair, which is very recent hair before she died. So was she on that type of diet earlier on, which is things that we are looking at. And and again, look at the in relation to the source, because of Takabuti, although we're not going to be looking at Takabuti, but other mummies in terms of where, where they were, where the water supply. And that sometimes can tell one whether, because these you know, the water you drunk and the oxygen gets in your body can be in there for a very long time. So it may tell you, for example, this person's living in Egypt now, but may have actually been from some other part of the world. You know, might, might, might have been one of these uh, uh, unfortunates that, you know, from the men who tap onwards just brought in large numbers into Egypt to help construct his uh, temples and other, 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 other buildings. Uh, not to mention other in relation to the economy of Egypt. They seem to be increasingly central, these people moved into the country. So there's, you know, the way that one can look at these things, so I think you can see the... So this is just the case, and again, with time I won't bother, but, but, it's, but basically the key thing is that you can look at these ratios, and if you've got a different ratio, it tells you, for example, Takabuti might have been eating marine fish as opposed to lots of meat, or whatever. So that's, and I apologise for the size, I was expecting, of course, at the other centre, the, the Mummification Museum, you know, the bigger screen. Finally, uh, water quality, because so far I've looked and very much the focus, as Professor David's mentioned, of course, of the centre is in, quite rightly, given the importance both ancient and modern, understanding things like modern diseases, on uh, human remains and uh, animal remains. But there are other, which are close to my heart, uh, of, and of course it relates to humans, and of course, in, in, and this is water quality. And one of the, and I say possible case study, because in fact we're off to, uh, to see Professor Kemp and other people, I'm sure many of you heard Professor Kemp, you know, in uh, Amarna to discuss this, because this relates to uh, at Amarna. And what interests me from my background is the, the, the number of wells. I mean, there seems to be an inordinate number of wells at uh, Tel Alamana, or you know, Achenaten's old uh, you know, city of Achenaten, the horizon of the Aten. Uh, and these firstly seem to be the first wells in the Nile Valley, as opposed to the Delta, which I found very surprising, uh, but seems to be the case. Uh, the interesting thing in terms of the, what I'll come to in a sec is the, the fact that the, the water in these wells are quite shallow, only a few metres. The question is, lots of these wells you know, there is a wonder, and you do think with Professor Kemp, I think, got it right. We all know that Akhenaten was a complete control freak, and it may have been he suggesting that, for wh whatever reason, these wells, you know, the, the people were forced to construct them despite the proximity of the Nile. In some cases, the Nile was only a few, few tens of metres away, but you've still got the wells. So I'm interested in well water quality, and two approaches one can use. Uh, firstly, you may think, well, surely you can't look at current water quality because, you know, obviously, um, you know, Amarna was abandoned, you know, 13, and whatever, 50 BC. Uh, but the evidence is, and talking to colleagues at Manchester in uh, geology, the, there's evidence, firstly, that the current wells uh, are saline, not the modern ones that the locals drink at that area, but the shallower ones that were constructed at the time of Akhenaten are saline. And the possibility is that they, if they're saline now, there's a distinct possibility, they were saline then. Uh, so I'll be looking at the salinity uh, of current you know, uh, water at that depth that the wells were constructed, just using these types of machines. And ideally, a transect away from the Nile as an indicator of past salinity. But also, and this is something that's slightly, and certainly be a learning curve for me, is modeling. Uh, 
anybody with that engineering, civil engineering background will know you can model, for example, water movement through soils and things like this, part of this important in understanding, even in terms of construction. So the other thing I want to do is actually predict what was going on in terms of the water quality and water quantity at that time. And final, and in terms of the last slide, is another approach related to this issue of past water quality, and these methods are applicable elsewhere, is uh, and what I've called historic soil and well water salinization is another good thing you can do is of course you can't sample the water from at the time of Akhenaten but there are organisms that lived at the time of Akhenaten in the wells that subsequently that died and these are things called diatoms, tiny little single cell plants there's billions of them in the ocean and in, in fresh water uh, when they die, they've got a shell which doesn't decay. So you can identify the diatoms, these little plants, tiny little plants under a microscope that are alive at the time of Akhenaten. Now, the, the in, the in, you may think, what on earth has that got to do with uh, looking at salinization at the time of Akhenaten? What it's got to do is the fact that you've got different types that are tolerant of different salinities. So if you find some types, it'll tell you the wells were relatively saline, or they, you know, other types will tell you no, it was quite fresh, uh, uh, fresh water. So again, I'll be looking, looking at that, well, I hope to, and as I say, and I put in, I thought that was bigger size, because obviously this is very much relating firstly to discussions with Professor Kemp, and of course University of Minia, because quite rightly, can't just be going there and taking samples, taking them out of the country, so of course this will be done in collaboration, of course, with Egyptian colleagues, uh, so th but this is the plan. So hopefully, uh, this has given you a flavour of the various kind of methods and approaches you know, that, uh, that can be used. So it's kind of exciting times, I think. And this is, in a sense, as you realise, I'm quite old. Uh, so I've come to this relatively late in my career because I really find interesting and, and some of the approaches that one can use uh, to look at some of the questions that Professor and, uh, David and I have uh, just discussed. So just, of course, acknowledgements. And again, you may think, my God, either, either he's a jack, as we say in English, a jack of all trades and a master of none, or that I'm incredibly intelligent, and hopefully it's not, well, I don't think either are true. Uh, and therefore, there are colleagues, again, from Professor David mentioned, well, not only Professor David, but in the University of Arts, from different schools and faculties who obviously have expertise and are working with us in some my, my specialism relates to things like trace metals electron microscopy but the colleagues for example just give the one example as i'll finish is uh, Prof. Uh, dr Bar uh, bart van dongen who's the ice uh, who's the gcms man and he will be doing the analysis for example takabuti to look at the the resins right so thank you very much Oh, yes. Okay. Questions? Did anyone has any question for Dr. Case or Rosalie David? You have one? Yeah, please. Do you want to? Okay. Yes. Yes. Um, the question is sort of special moments that we've had in the, the work over the years. Um, I think when we unwrapped the mummy, 
um, it was, we wouldn't do it today, but um, it was an interesting study in that there were things in the mummy when you unwrapped it which you could not see on the x-rays, um, such as gilded finger and toenail covers. Um, there was a guinea worm infestation in the mummy. So all those were quite um, revelations. And she also had uh, false feet um, because the legs were amputated, one above the knee, one below the knee, and then they made false legs and false feet. So again, from the x-rays, you couldn't make that out, but um, it was filmed, of course, the unwrapping, and they captured that moment on all our faces when we saw these things for the, for the first time. And the sandals that were on the base of the feet, I mean, I thought nobody has looked at these, nobody's seen them for 2,000 years. So you were looking at something that um, had not been seen for that period of time. I think one of the other things was with the, um, the schistosome, the parasite, um, which was found in one of the mummies. And then when my, my colleague, um, Patricia Rutherford, identified the DNA in the parasite, and that was the first time that that had ever been done. And we'd almost jumped around the lab in joy. So yes, along the line, there have been these, um, these moments, yeah, yeah. Thanks. More questions? They could look after these things in particular. And it was a real eye-opener And to me when all the evidence was gathered together was, yes, they did have all these diseases, neurological conditions, including the support system was such that they could live and have reasonable lives within the society. And I think that says a huge amount about the way the society was, really.
use in Manchester you have a problem with Portuguese in the field and then have a right equivalent Portuguese kind of degree. In the field as opposed to being in Manchester. Yeah, I mean, sorry. Yes, this is, this is something which presumably will need to be developed because um, you have facilities in, in big universities, but you need methods that can be used at sites as well. Um, Keith, who is? Yes, sorry, what was, what was the question? Um, as a in in uh, Manchester, in New Zealand, yeah. yeah, I understand. Yeah, one realises there are issues with material coming out of it. Of course, there are, you know, there's potential, of course, collaboration. So, so to answer your question, there are certainly things that can be done using our machinery. And some of them, some of them are not that expensive because these machinery will then exist, whether for medical or other reasons. And therefore, you know, the extra weight and that can be just a matter of a few pounds. Uh, but one of the things I really like about the, you know, that government, you know, is literally that, you know, we have them in Manchester, so there's a possibility of bringing those out here. So of course, then we can obviously bring those projects. Well, you know, that's the thing that I think is really important. I didn't either put it in. Yeah, no, I understand. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I understand. Yeah. 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 Yeah.